Well, a fantastic end to the voyage for Shubhanshu Shukla, Group Captain Shukla, back on Earth now uh, with uh, the Crew Dragon spacecraft successfully splashing off uh, the coast of San Diego a couple of hours back. Uh, it's been an exciting visit, one which was delayed a great deal at the onset, but ultimately it seems to have worked out just fine. To tell us a little bit about the importance of this mission and their thoughts on India's space program, Clayton Anderson, a former NASA scientist, joins us, and Muri Baja, a professor of aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics at the University of Texas. Thank you both very much for being with us. Uh, professor Jai, I was speaking to you a Namaste. couple of days back. Namaste. I was speaking to you a couple of days back, and uh, uh, we were both fairly excited about you know, this particular mission. Um, for the benefit of our viewers, how is that last phase, uh, just as they splash down, uh, perhaps the most critical phase of the flight itself? It's something people don't often talk about, but it's been that. It's been at, a, at one level dangerous, at one level exciting, uh, right from the onset of uh, crewed missions to space. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, uh, and greetings to everybody. Look, even though uh, we send satellites and we send people with some frequency and routine, there's nothing uh, normal about going to space and flying at several times the speed of a bullet and then coming back down and going through Earth's atmosphere, slowing down drastically and uh, you know splashing in the ocean. So as you said, it's, it is a critical phase. There's a lot of danger in it. And uh, if nothing else, you know, we saw the expressions of Schutz's parents, yeah. uh, you know, when, 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 when he got down safely, I was very moved by his mother uh, being relieved. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Clayton Anderson, um, again, you know, your thoughts on, on this phase of the flight. Uh, there was that six to seven minute uh, blackout in communications because of high temperatures and the uh, buildup of plasma around uh, the, the crew module. Um, and that's always been the case, but it adds to the tension, doesn't it? When, you know, mission control reaches out to them and says, can you hear us? You know, I mean, can you hear us? And, uh, and then it took a couple of times before that communication link was established. It does. It's important to understand that uh, for every space flight, we're going to go through the atmosphere to come home. And that plasma does cause us to lose communication. But uh, you know, we've done it before. We understand what's supposed to happen, and we can plan for that. We can prepare for that. Um, I think that uh, Shibanchu was extremely excited, probably a little nauseous uh, as he was coming home, and um, that's part of the deal, too. Uh, but I agree with my colleague. When, when you look at all this, it is not normal. It is difficult. It has always been difficult, and space flight is hard. So we have to understand that we make it look easy all the time, uh, but it's not, and we need to be ready to deal with uh, any situation that arises in this very dangerous endeavor. Uh, Professor Moriba Jha, um, what amazes me is that uh, this, uh, the, the Crew Dragon spaceship, which uh, splashed down today, the, the crew capsule, will be used again for space flight. It can be flown perhaps on as many as five occasions. Uh, and I ask you this question because I know that you, know, you are... Um, you know, you're worried about the environment. You're certainly worried about uh, debris over space. Um, do you believe that the ability now to reuse capsules over and over again uh, is, uh, you know, it's much more friendly, not just from an economic standpoint, uh, but also perhaps from an ecological standpoint as well? Yeah, I mean, I fully agree with that. And as you said, as somebody who uh, believes in stewardship of the planet in orbital space, reuse and repurposing is absolutely necessary. I mean, I will say that the space shuttle was reusable as well. But, uh, but yeah, in terms of a capsule, it's good to see that, um, you know, the Crew Dragon is something that is reusable and can be reused multiple times to m minimize this idea of just single use, you know, rockets and capsules going into orbit. Clayton Anderson, the big focus for us here in India is now going to be our own crewed flight. Gaganyan, it's about two hours, uh, two years away. And, um, you know, there are all sorts of tests. We've had a pad uh, abort test taking place already, and there'll be uh, more te such tests before it actually happens. Can you give us your thoughts on, you know, India's space program and how, you know, we've got a certain set of ambitions which by and large have been realized so far? Yes, I think that 
India needs to understand they're doing a great job so far, uh, but they've got a ways to go. Uh, they have a lot of help, though, in the world these days. There's lots of expertise around the globe of people who have been there and done this before. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I hope that they will capitalize on that availability of that expertise. Uh, it's important to know that they have to focus on safety, safety of the crew, safety of the spacecraft, and then safety of the mission. Um, but I think it's a very exciting time for ISRO and the folks of India to uh, have Shubhanshu back on Earth successfully after a, a very cool mission to the International Space Station, and I'm a firm believer that we cannot go farther into our solar system and perhaps someday the universe uh, without doing this collaboratively. We have to do it together. We have to be on the same page. Uh, and I think that expertise that comes from various parts of our Earth allows us to be more effective. So uh, congratulations. Uh, Professor Ja, I think um, you know what uh, Mr. Anderson speaks about is important. Uh, India is part of the uh, uh, Artemis Accords, which talks about the peaceful use of space. Um, you know, every nation has its own um, space ambitions, but in, in terms of working together, developing to technology together, planning missions together, and perhaps even sharing uh, funding together, how is it, uh, how crucial is that as we try and, uh, you know, expand our, our boundaries? So I have to say that uh, I can't agree more with Clayton uh, in everything that, that he just said. Um, I think that, you know, we have to look at space exploration as one humanity, even though we have multiple nations and each of us uh, in our nations, we have sovereignty. But the idea of exploration, the ability to do this in a way that makes sense, that's affordable, and quite frankly, that is inclusive of our cosmo visions, our values, and how we do this, it needs to be a global effort. There's no, um, there's no shame in getting help. Everybody has different strengths and weaknesses. India has its own strengths and weaknesses, the United States, China, Russia. Uh, and I think we need to build upon our strengths to try to minimize our weaknesses and do this as one, one humanity uh, going forward and being able to share uh, the knowledge that's created than the expertise that's developed uh, as a consequence of exploration uh, as one humanity. And yet, Clayton Anderson, um, you know, competition in space has been typically what we've seen over the decades. You know, when the Cold War was on, there was intense competition between the United States and the Soviet Union. That's, of course, changed now, but we've got China come along with uh, an exemplary space program, but one which uh, perhaps many of us don't really have an insight into. Uh, would you say that in as much as we talk about the peaceful use of space, competition between nations is not going away anywhere? Well, there's always competition. Uh, you know, people tend to look at this from their own uh, socio socioeconomic impact status and, and their own country and, and what they're doing, what they can do. Uh, what does that bring back to us? Uh, and it but you look at the International Space Station, it's a great example of what happens when countries come together to do things together uh, to the best of their ability, and everybody weighs in on problems and solutions. That's key to me. Uh, I would really like to see the United States partner with China, but uh, you know that's a, a tough road to get the U.S. government to agree to. But uh, we have to build that coalition. We have to be the leaders from the United States who push that into uh, existence. And I'm hoping we can do that. It's very, very important to me that we continue, but we continue globally, not just as the United States, for the simple reason that we cannot afford it alone. Um, you know, and the idea here is to do things that impact all humans on Earth through the technology that we develop. I don't care if we go to the moon, I don't care if we go to Mars or an asteroid, it's the technology that gets developed along the way that will come back to benefit all humans on the planet Earth. And for me, that's a big key. Professor Jha, what is it that excites you most about forthcoming missions? Uh, are there robotic missions around, for example, Venus or even Mars? Or are you really looking forward to crewed flight um, and, and deep space in that regard? Yeah, so, you know, my, uh, my perspectives on these issues may seem a bit uh, controversial. Here's what I want to say. I think that 
humans need to explore space. I think just like humans are visitors to the oceans, humans will be visitors to other planets. We evolved on this planet. Earth is our home, and it's the best home we'll ever have in the universe, for sure. But I think that um, as we develop artificial intelligence, augmented intelligence, you know, I've, uh, I've actually hypothesized the next hominid, right? So, so, so we've, there have been many hominids. Homo sapiens is the current one. Everything evolves. Homo sapiens is not the last hominid, hopefully, not by our own means. I mean, if, if we get in our own way, we will be. But um, if evolution continues, I predict that the next hominid will be what I call homo machina. And homo machina will be a synthesis of homo sapiens and machines. And I think that homo machina will be very much prepared to live on other celestial bodies and even capable of interstellar travel. So we need to keep them exploring for sure. Mr. Anderson, last question to you. What mission excites you the most going forward? Well, that's a good question. I guess I would have to say the moon or Mars. I think that we are destined, as, as we've talked about today, to go somewhere else. <clears throat> and where is that? It can be Mars. It can be the moon. I'm an advocate to go to the moon first because it's, it's a training ground. It's a close test bed. It's a place where if we have an issue, we're not too far from Earth. Uh, communication can be steady. Communication can be frequent. Uh, you know, that trip to Mars is pretty daunting, regardless of what everybody tells you and what you hear on TV and in the movies. Um, it's going to be pretty tough. And the folks that go there first are going to have uh, a tough road to hoe. So uh, I guess I would, I would have to say, if you're going to make me pick, I would say moon first and then Mars. Uh, but they're both very exciting and uh, very difficult. Indeed. Well, uh, Clayton Anderson and Marie Bajja, thank you both very much for, for being with us. It's, exciting, uh, it's an exciting day in India today. There are so many young people watching this program who would be genuinely enthused about, uh, about space and the prospects over there. Uh, so thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. We leave it there. Thank you very much for being with us. Goodbye.